So welcome everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Alexey Avanov, I'm the Principal Solutions Consultant with Pega Systems. Uh, I've been with Pega close to six years now, uh, focusing solely on the federal clients, uh, USD, USDA, Department of Justice, and others. And today we're gonna look at some of the capabilities that Pega has around mobility, uh, including field service, mobile case management, our general approach, and, and I'll look forward to some uh, new capabilities that we're releasing uh, with the ne next iteration of the platform and also seeing some cool demos, or hopefully cool demos. Um, so for those who might not be fully kind of uh, aware of Pega's mobile capabilities, so Pega goes to market, especially around mobile, in four discrete areas. All right, there's a traditional mobile web, there's a mobile client, there's mashup SDK, or kind of a mashup where you already have an app, uh, or a fully kind of a headless native configuration and build. We're gonna look at each one of these um, in, in particular, and look at what are the pros and cons, look at you know, how you know, various agencies, agencies are using them, and then look at some examples or some demos of how, especially in a mobile field, field worker or an offline user, um, where, which one of these four options make the most sense. So the first one being kind of the mobile web, and that's a traditional, you know, I have my PEG application, I want to access it from a mobile browser. Uh, this is Nothing, nothing gets deployed to the device. Uh, I have just a, my phone, iPhone, iOS, Windows, I pull up Safari, Chrome, whatever, access the device, and Pega with our HTML5 and CSS3 capabilities will render the, the mobile look and feel, uh, readjust the page layouts to make it look like it belongs on a mobile, uh, mobile platform. Uh, the, the benefits of this is you basically, the same application you have on your desktop is now available on, on, your, on your device. Um, it's fully reusable, right? There's, there's no dependency on the, on the, on the device or the, the form factor. Um, still uses our model-driven approach for UI and, and just application generation. Um, but you kind of lose out in certain things, right? So the mobile phone has cameras, GPS, uh, local storage, might have additional capabilities around uh, maps, you know, IR code scanners, et cetera. Obviously through the browser, there's limited interaction between what a browser can access on the device versus what a native app can do. Uh, so Pega has a Pega mobile client, which basically takes your Pega application and wraps it in a, in a, in a wrapper or a mobile client that is then deployed as an application to the device. Right, so instead of you using the browser now, you have a fully branded uh, application on iOS, uh, Android, and we're recently gonna uh, launch Windows. Um, for, for you to be able to come in and actually use the same application, but in, it makes it look and feel as if it was a native app. Uh, these are some examples, uh, including some of the additional plug-in capabilities for uh, maps, and then this is an example on the right-hand side from United Healthcare Group, which went live, I believe, earlier this, this fall about enrolling Medicare uh, participants uh, using their mobile field service. The big, the big reason to use this is offline capability. So unlike with a browser, where you, you require connection to the server, with the, the native client or the, the mobile client, we now have uh, offline capability allowing you to do work in a fully disconnected mode. Um, you still take advantage of the Pega you know, model-driven UI to design and build once, deploy it and then within that container. Uh, you still are using the same business rules, processes, screens, flows that you've designed on the desktop, but now they're on the mobile device. Um, there's connectivity or support for offline disconnected modes. Obviously, Pega being you know, a traditional client-server application, not all the bells and whistles of Pega, you know, decisioning and other components will natively run offline, but we're making leaps and bounds uh, and having our clients kind of feed, feed back into us the key things that they want to do offline. And with the recent releases, we, you can basically take full application kind of processes end-to-end, -end, subflows, user screens, uh, decisions, some limited decision logic, all to be run in a fully disconnected mode. And you'll see an example of it in a second. And then you have access to design device capabilities, things like camera, uh, GPS, local storage. Um, but also it allows you to do certain interesting things like embed additional third-party native application or APIs. So for example, for those who, who might be using GIS, right, Esri, Mapbox, all of those provide some native offline storage for maps. Now with a hybrid client or the native client, you can actually combine and create a module, a custom module that is, lives within the application, allowing you to take maps in a disconnected mode. We actually had other clients that do uh, have specific devices 
with embedded you know, laser scanners, QR code readers. So it's a device specific capability to be able to scan the QR code like an inventory system. And with, a, with our mobile client, you can actually now hook into those device you know, bells and whistles to be able to invoke those directly from the PEG application. Um, the third approach, uh, it's more prevalent in the, in, the, in the commercial sector, is where you already have a mobile app. Right? You might have an application for your bank that is already deployed to all your customers. It just is not reasonable for you to take that app, pull it off the market, and recreate it again with Pega. In which case, we have a Pega mashup, uh, mobile mashup capability. So what you're seeing here in those orange highlighted boxes are both combination data coming from Pega and user screens coming from Pega directly into an existing native application. So if you already have an app and you want to extend it with some capability you have built with Pega, uh, you can just plug in using our mashup SDK um, uh, and extend the existing application using Pega capability to build out. Uh, the caveat here is you're then responsible for all the offline capabilities and, and all the local storage. We just provide you kind of a, a view into the Pega server directly from your native app. Um, obviously, you can still leverage your model-driven UI, so the UI is still coming from the same UIs you, you've, you've built. Um, you can call us now using the Pega 7 API to pull in data, uh, authenticate directly with the server using the native app. Uh, once again, cross-platform support. We support Android, iOS, and Windows. So if you have a, you know, an application in any one of those platforms, you can extend it with Pega capabilities. And you have kind of combination of reuse for native and browser-based technology. Finally, it's kind of the, the fourth and final you know, capability is that you can use Pega kind of in a headless mode. So instead of you using the existing user screens um, that you've developed in Pega, you can build your own custom um, application using something like Angular, Objective-C, Swift, or Android Studio. So the traditional mobile development uh, users can come in, build an app, and hook into Pega using services. So Pega becomes kind of a headless uh, implementation where all the UI, all the business logic, all the rendering is now depending on the, your native developer to do. Uh, we see some, some examples where it, it might make, it, make sense because you, know, you might only be targeting iOS devices um, where you really, really want to crunch out as much you know, optimization as possible, um, where it might, might, might make sense to, to actually create a native app. Uh, it's a little bit more higher performant uh, because you actually are coding natively to the device. Um, and then you, but the downsides is you, you can't leverage the existing user interfaces or the, the assets you've built in Pega. You obviously need to then maintain multiple code bases. So if you, you've got your iOS developers, you have your Android developers, all of them are developing in different IDEs. Um, you now have to figure out and sync between them to make sure the same functionality is available across, across device platforms. Uh, and then the reuse factor becomes a little bit of an issue where you had things you're, you already have in Pega, you know, process flows, et cetera, now only are available via service calls. Um, so there's, there's good and bad to why um, the mobile SDK makes sense. So if we look across all of them, uh, you saw the four, four pillars, so to speak. Uh, on the bottom of them, you have reusability across all four. Right? You have the Pega platform shared between all four approaches. So if you have access to the case management, the BPM, the decisioning capabilities, uh, the data integration and the API layers are reusable across all four. But if you notice, the first three actually take advantage of our you know, mobile UI. So the user interface and the user screens you've developed in the Pega application are now available for you to be reused on those mobile devices, as opposed to in the fourth, in the mobile SDK approach, um, you actually have to write your own or hand crank your own user screens. Um, and these are kind of the, the, the four main ways you could take Pega Mobile. Uh, when we talk about field service and case management, um, it's kind of interesting because I think two of those make the most sense, and that's being I think the second one where it's Pega, Pega client, client, and then the last one where it's a, a fully custom app. And the main reason is because you need offline connectivity. So either we provide it to you as part of our Pega mobile client, or you have to hand crank it using the native application. Um, so this is an interesting quote I, I pulled from IDC. Uh, US mobile worker population will grow to 1.5 or 105.4 million mobile workers in 2020, um, and they'll account for 72.3% of the total population workforce. So it's, it's coming. Users are going to be more and more mobile. Uh, and IDC kind of puts them in two buckets. Um, bucket one is the office-based mobile worker. And these are people that are occasionally mobile, 
right? They, they might be going out in the field for a sales call. They might be going out uh, doing a quick inspection, an investigation, healthcare workers, insurance, un insurance underwriters. And then there's the non-office base. So these people are always in the field all the time. So they never touch a desktop. And these would be kind of delivery truck drivers, manufacturing, retail, transportation, um, people that basically live you know, on a truck or, or, in a, or in a car, going door to door, doing, doing calls. And from both of these, you know, we've got kind of strategic applications that we can bring to bear. Right, for, the, for the occasional or office-based mobile worker, you know, the traditional Pega 7 platform with our strategic applications provides a lot of the infrastructure and a lot of capabilities uh, to, to help those individuals and build, build solutions for those. For non-office-based, non we actually have a specific strategic application called uh, Pega Field Service for, for Manufacturing. And right now it's kind of solely focusing in the manufacturing warranty area, uh, but there is a specific standalone strategic app that we call Pega Field Service. Uh, the idea being is, you know, it, no matter which one you choose, you kind of get capabilities with Pega um, just natively out of the box. Obviously, you know, location proximity maps, offline if you're using hybrid, uh, hybrid container, push notifications, you can still use your, you know, the, the, the current user interfaces you've designed, uh, capture signature, you know, do touch ID for iOS and we're working to do touch ID or the fingerprint scanner for Android devices as well. Uh, create pictures and capture pictures while disconnected. Uh, QR code scanners, custom branding uh, and icons. Uh, and Pega, including, uh, Pega also has mobile application management and mobile device management capabilities. So if you don't have an AirWatch or what was it, MOS 360 as your MDM or MAM um, providers, Pega has kind of an AMP manager or Pega mobile manager to actually push applications to a device or pull the application from the device um, and do things like that. Any questions so far? So a lot of times when we look at offline, and then I'll show you a demo, um, you know, we, we kind of take a different approach to offline. So some, some, some companies might do kind of a hybrid approach where you either, you know, you have the ability to go offline at any point, which, at which point some, some capabilities lock down. Right, so your application might degrade uh, if, you, if you lose connectivity. With Pega, we take a slightly different approach, and we call it you know, mobile first. Uh, you probably might have seen it called OSCO. Online is a special case of offline. Basically, we, we always treat, you know, if, if we're going offline, we always assume that you're going to be offline. Internet connection is just a benefit to us. It basically makes us um, drain the information off the device quicker than we were if we were offline. And the way it works is the very first time you log in, you know, the, the application, your device requests all the, all the assets, all the components that make up the application and locally brings it out to the device. So this would be your process flows, your user screens, your business rules, and also case data. So the very first time you kind of pre-provision your device. If you're connected, you know, the, the PEGA application automatically syncs data back and forth. So as you're completing cases, data is changing on the server, each time that transaction happens, you're, you're keeping automatically synced. Eventually, when you go offline, either by accident, you, you enter a tunnel, or you, know, you specifically go in a rural area and, and turn off or turn on airplane mode, what happens is we, we detect the fact that you don't have connectivity, and we start storing any changes you make on a device locally. So there's a store and forward capability where each time you maybe process a case, you know, fill out a form, instead of going back to the server, we basically keep it in local storage until connectivity is reestablished. As soon as it's reestablished, either you, know, you turn on you know, your mobile data network or you come in uh, to, to basically 4G, 3G connectivity, uh, we, we basically start pushing those payloads off the device back to the server, uh, rinse and repeat. So the idea here is we, we never really depend on internet to get the work done uh, in, in this offline approach. So it doesn't really matter to us if you're connected or disconnected. The idea is we don't want to degrade your performance or, or treat your application differently um, if all of a sudden you lose connectivity. We want to account for that and have it perform you know, the same way whether, whether you do have a connection or you don't have a connection. So let me show you a quick demo. Let's see, let me full screen this. How much information can you, you know, locally store? 
So the, 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 the beauty of, uh, or the, the, the nice thing about, about the Pega mobile client is that it doesn't impose any device storage restrictions. It's basically as much space as you have on the device. Right, so uh, as opposed to on a browser, you know, some people might ask, well, HTML5 has local storage capabilities. If you ever tried to store a lot of data within the browser, it'll start prompting you that, hey, we only allow you to store 10 megs or something like that. With a, with a mobile client, we have the full, full access to the file system, and we can store as much data as, as the phone permits and detect if, if you, for example, you're running low on space or, or, or you're running low on, on device storage because you have all this iTunes photos, selfies, whatever, um, have that proactively be notified. So question? Yeah, just related to the, uh, the sync, are you then cleaning off all cases um, from the mobile device or are you kind of keeping the history of everything that's happened? So it, it, it basically, as soon as you finish a case, it syncs back to the server yeah. um, and then you, you basically continue on as, as, as normal. So you, you're pushing, you're pulling data off the device as, as soon as connectivity is reestablished. So you never store it indefinitely uh, because at the end of the day it needs to go back to the Pega server uh, to be processed or, or, or sent down to the you know, system of records or whatever. Did that answer your question? Yes. So this is my iPhone. I have it in my hand. I've hooked it up to, to the device, uh, to the iPad here, or to the MacBook. And I'm going to show you two applications. First is going to be the example of a uh, Pega uh, mobile client. This is an example that we built recently recently, a couple months ago for the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, where if you know what U.S. Census does, they have enumerators go into the field, uh, they collect data, both urban and rural areas, uh, and they need both online and offline connectivity capabilities. And then I'll also show you kind of a native example, which is the Metropolis app, uh, which was built also by Pega, but it's used as the fourth approach where, you know, we, we're leveraging Pega via services only, uh, but hand-cranked or hand-wrote wrote RUI. So for census, I'm going to log, you know, open up an application. And this is a Pega um, mobile portal. And we have currently several cases assigned to this user. So without getting too much into the census business use cases, they have two types of work. Uh, one of them being, you know, I'm going to go knock on the door. The other one is to actually send individuals around the United States uh, collecting and verifying addresses. So before they actually send somebody out, they need to verify that all the addresses in the US are accounted for. Um, so that's the address canvassing or ad can cases that they speak of. So I'm going to pull one up here. So ad can block 2014. Uh, it's an actual block. You know, if, you, if you're not familiar with a block, it's state, county, track, block. It's a geographic you know, breakup of, of the US uh, region. Uh, but you know, an individual might get assigned a case to go and, and basically walk the block and record all the addresses they see. Uh, or verify that those houses are still there, they haven't burnt down, there's no new construction. But even from here, they can open a block map. And in this case, we're actually using a module. This one is backed by my Mapbox. We're actually working on another one, or a similar one with Esri, uh, ArcGIS, to be able to look at spatial and imagery data directly on the device. So I can come in here, click on various houses, get some information about them, zoom in, zoom out. And this, this block is actually way out by the census, census headquarters in Suitland, Maryland. But right now, I'm fully connected. And I can zoom in, zoom out. And as I'm zooming in, I'm actually storing that imagery and that map data on the device to, to, to be able to be used when, when I go offline. So let's go ahead and do that now. So let's go airplane mode. So when I went to airplane mode, as you can see on the upper right, uh, the app knows that all of a sudden I lost network connectivity, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to operate in offline mode. So I'm going to go ahead and click Next. And what's going to happen is the app is going to start you know, transitioning through the same process I was, you know, what it would have done if I was connected. Uh, if you notice on the right, there's now one item to sync. Um, and that's basically one, one iteration of a, of a message that would have went out back to the server that never made it because we didn't have connectivity. So this is now sitting on the device waiting for, for connectivity to be reestablished. And from here, I can then come in and start working my addresses. In this case, I have a particular address. Uh, I could set the different statuses, you know, collect information about this particular household. I can actually pull up a map for this particular house, zoom into it. As you can see, I'm using it on in a disconnected mode. Move the, move the marker, so as part of the use case, 
they need to be able to readjust you know, the, the location of that particular household so they can update their, their records of where that particular latitude and longitude is. And then perform an action. So let's say I'm going to verify that this house is exactly where I expect it to be. So once I click out of it, you see some, some updates about you know, the status has been verified. I've collected some more additional latitude and longitude coordinates, so the idea being even though we're disconnected, you know, GPS doesn't require internet connectivity. So as long as I have a separate GPS transponder on the phone, I can still con communicate, get my lat long coordinates. Uh, and I've actually captured two points of reference, both where the device is right now, which is the, in the museum, and also where was the point dragged onto the map. Uh, in the census use case, it's for fraud, right? So I might be getting assigned cases, I might be sitting at McDonald's or at a museum pretending to work you know, 30 miles away, silently, quickly, quickly completing cases, nobody would ever know. But actually, we're recording where you were when you completed this particular action. So then, you know, in the back end, we can kind of match how far you were from the particular assignment and maybe flag you for, you know, a closer look to see whether or not you actually were where you say where you were or you're kind of pretending to be, you know, in front of this house. So once I click Saved, you'll see my, this particular unit moves to our work queue. And I have other unworked items. In this case, this is a large block. So the idea is the user walks around the block, verifies each address. Eventually, he submits this particular case. In this case, uh, it actually won't let me submit. So the idea is you know, we actually want to perform some business rules and validations to say, you, know, you had 12 things to do. In this case, you had 12 addresses to visit. You've so far visited only one. You have 11 remaining, so we're not going to let you you know, claim all done, unless there's some reason, and this is where the send incomplete capability we built in to say, well, there's a dangerous situation, there's a tornado coming, there's a, you know, an earthquake or something, basically allow them to, to complete it, but provide some sort of a reason why this shouldn't be, shouldn't be done. Question? Yes, yeah, so in offline mode, how are you geo-tracking them? So if they go in offline mode, do these 12 houses and then they, come back online in the McDonald's, like in your example, mm -hmm. how do you know that they didn't actually do it in offline mode where they were and now come back? Yeah, so we, we have both a device location. So there's this, this phone has a GPS transponder or receiver you know, that doesn't depend on internet connectivity. So we're capturing each time they complete a step or do something or it's wherever in the process is, we can say grab the device location. Um, and also grab the location and we know from you know, the data that was passed in around this particular case, this particular address has this Latin long coordinates. So we can match those two together. Carrier? Are you using the mobile carriers? No, this is, this is directly to GPS. GPS. Yep. So if I don't send and complete and click next, I'll basically be taken back to the main screen. You know, so it kind of feeds, feeds back the, the, you know, the requirements loop of until I'm fully complete, I'm going to kind of bring you back to this, to this case over and over again. Question? So from a case manager standpoint, when you check these out, are you locking them on the other side? No. So if someone's working on it when you sync, if somebody did something else on the background, what happens? Yep. So this is a good question because you know, by default to take this offline, the idea being you might be offline a day, you might be offline for a week. Uh, we want, don't want to lock out lock the case for somebody else to come in and pick up. So uh, by default, if you offline enable an application, it enables optimistic locking. So that means that anybody else can come in and grab that lock for you. So as part of, if we go back online, let me and reestablish connection, just pay attention to the upper right. What's going to happen if somebody comes in and actually changes the case, uh, when syncing happens, it might be not an issue, right? Somebody just added a field um, or, or changed some, some attributes, uploaded a file specific to that case. In which case, with the sync, would it happen automatically? Nothing would happen. But there's, there's possibility that somebody actually finished the case while it was fully disconnected. In which case, we, during the sync, would, dedi would, would realize that there was, there was a conflict. Uh, and this case would then get routed to a specific work basket for somebody to come in and look at and figure out what exactly was the conflict that, that happened. So there, there's timestamps both on the case on the device and the case on the server, and we're matching those timestamps against each other to make sure that you know, the, the case state on the server matches the case state we're expecting um, and, and trigger specific workflow or, or escalations depending upon you know, 
if, if somebody changes it, we'll move it to a, to a work basket for somebody to manually come in and look and, and resolve. Can you write a conflict? Yep, and this is, this is where we're getting into some, some, some capabilities where the product is actually pushing, pushing forward to do some auto resolution. Perhaps you know, all of a sudden the field is required on, on the form and have that instead of routing to somebody just to fill in the field, to kind of bring in that change onto the device and be able to auto resolve without having to involve a kind of a, a feedback loop. So yeah, that, that's definitely being planned and, and is actively being worked on. So this is one use case, right? This is, this is kind of sh highlighting um, some geo, geospatial capabilities. You know, in this case, it's, it's a Mapbox GIS vendor, which is a cloud-only vendor. Uh, we're actually working, Census has, has, has recently decided to, uh, they already have a significant Esri presence, so we're working closely with Esri to do some of this and even more uh, on their, using their capabilities. The other use case is basically taking uh, a particular case, knocking on the door and collecting information. So Pega has always had a Pega survey capability. So survey is you know, an additional you know, set of capabilities around being able to define a um, set of questionnaires, uh, sequence them together for data collection purposes. Uh, mostly it's been used traditionally in healthcare. So if a healthcare worker goes to the door or visits with a patient, there might be a questionnaire that they, they fill out. In this case, we're going to use the survey capability to do uh, address or field, field enumeration, as they call it. So in this case, we're going to go basically through a set of questions. So me, as a enumerator or census user, I'm driven through a process of how do I approach a person at the door? Right? Is this a personal visit? Yes. Um, are you attempting contact at this particular location? Yes. And this is where, once again, we, we, we geocode where I am right now with the device versus where the address is and ask an additional question. You know, hey, you're actually kind of far away from this Suitland address. <laughs> you know, do you want to continue the interview? And this basically, once again, reiterates you know, best, you know, good practices from a, from a worker, a field worker perspective. Um, and also um, allows us to detect fraud, even if it's not proactively, you know, warning you on the, on the screen. It might be behind the scenes, all the auto trail is capturing the lat and, fought, lat and lon, longitude of, the, of each action. So you can then come back and, and reevaluate and review where the individual was. So then you get to this screen. Hello, my name is so and so. I'm from the Census Bureau. Um, and this is the first screen from a census use case where they actually interact with the respondent. So hopefully in, I think 2017, it doesn't have any mobile uh, interactions 2018, unless you live in West Virginia, Portland, or Washington. Those are the currently 2018 field test regions where in, this is going to be fielded. Um, so individuals, a, a smallest set of users from, from the United States for 2018 test will be experiencing this, this door knock. But as part of this, we actually are able to do some additional cool things, is localize on the device um, to Chinese, you know, Spanish. So multi-language localization on a mobile device is available. And this uses the same configuration, the same locale settings, the same locale and translation that you have on the server. So as part of that initial data sync that you saw me show, we're actually bringing down all the translations directly onto the device. So they're available for you uh, to run both online and offline. The more interesting one is Arabic. So if you notice, and I don't speak Arabic, but Arabic is actually a, a right-to-left language. Um, so as opposed to just you know, translating, we actually flip the text as part of this. So this, let's go back to English. All of this is then available for you to come in, basically start the data capture process, and collect the data. As we go, there might be help sections, so proactive help you know, that is configured per screen. Uh, so you can then come in and not have to look at a big FAQ, um, but actually have screen-specific help that you've configured in the application available on, on the device. So I'm not going to go through the full, full application. I'll just show you one last thing. So let's say I'm, I'm not a good enumerator. I try to kind of force my way through this application uh, and not enter my username. So there's both validation and business rule validation that happens on the device. 
So to say, you know, in this case, we don't allow a user or enumerator to proceed without answering some information around the user's first name and last name. So it blocks processing um, and provides the, the error validation and error checks to ensure clean data collection. Um, eventually, this goes through, you know, we collect the number of people, the roster, the interrelationships, dates of birth, uh, the gender, race, ethnicity, uh, and eventually post this back up to the server. So the hope and the plan is for 2018, if you're in West Virginia, Portland, there might be somebody coming to your door with this, with this device or a similar device um, actually collecting that information. That is if you didn't respond via internet. So for those of you who don't know, 2020 will be one of the first, or the first US census to be done electronically via internet. And the more people do it on the internet, the cheaper it will be for, for us as a whole. So uh, go ahead and fill it out. Uh, and you can avoid having somebody show up at your door, you know, collecting this information. So that's, you know, Pega native client or, or Pega mobile client where it's deployed as a, as a native application. It's styled to meet the, the needs of the business. Um, it's deployed using the same certificates that you know, your traditional native application would do. Um, but it's using all the rules, all the screens, all the business logic was configured in Pega. Right, so if, you, if I was to log in on the server, I could go through the same process flow, fully connected, um, and reuse that um, on the server as well. The other example I'm gonna do is this Metropolis app, which is the, the fourth kind of pillar of mobile capability, where in this case, all the UI you see was not written by Pega, or wasn't written in Pega, but somebody, this I believe is Swift for iOS. So we had a, our team uh, wrote this to test out the APIs. So Pegas, Pega 7 has a full API capability. So as part of that, we wanted to really test that you can do anything we can do with Pega UI, but do it with a kind of a headless implementation. In which case, we built this Metropolis app where you can submit like a pothole request. So as opposed to using you know, the Pega UI screens, these are all custom built, uh, but provide kind of similar things. In this case, this is, I believe, a Google map. We can collect the information. There's a pothole here. And then we can attach a photo. And attaching a photo also is available in the mobile client as well. I just haven't shown it to you because as part of some government agencies, census included, you're not allowed to capture you know, house information via photos and store it for in, in the government database. So depending on the use case, photos might not be uh, allowed. I think they call them housies instead of a selfie, it's a housey. Uh, so we asked, well, you know, wouldn't it make sense if you, you come down to a, to a burned address and you're saying that there's no house here to at least take a photo? No. You know, OIG and, and the oversight committee will, would, would definitely not like that. So once we submit this, um, this goes back to the Pega server and submits this case um, kind of asynchronously using their, our Pega 7 APIs. So these are the two examples um, of, of two types of apps. One's being been, that's been designed and built with Pega, hybrid client, and the other that's been used or that you use is the Pega 7 API. So it still invokes the same processes behind the scenes, but you lose out on the, the quick ability to change user screens, um, you know, tie the business rules and, and the user screens together. Um, so in, in this case, if somebody changes the, the required fields, it's not you know, as, as easy as check in, check out, you know, save and resync to the device. Now you have to go back to your, to the mobile developers, tell them that, you know, remember that screen you created where you captured the pothole? Please make that required or add an additional screen, recompile, redeploy to the app store. So, we looked at the high level architecture. So high level capabilities are offline capabilities and I think we saw some of these here. Um, both, you know, you can log in, log, in, log out offline. Um, create work, create cases, um, flow case processing, all available, you know, as part of that initial data sync, we get the full process, all the user screens, all the business rules. You can do peg a survey, you can, you can get into localization, so if you have locales. Um, Auto, auto data sync, you no longer have to care about online, offline, Pega does it behind the scenes for you. Um, and then there's the ability to extend the application with plug-in modules for things like maps, laser scanners, et cetera. There's a question. Do you 
mentioned like the JS stuff, like YouTube says or something else. Are there any GIS functions built natively into Pekka that comes out of the box? Or do you always have to buy a third party app? So out of the box, we, we're, we're using Google Maps. Uh, so you still have to get the Google Maps API key. Uh, but with Google Maps, it, it requires connectivity. All right, so you, even though you can use, and we do have it as part of our mobile client, you can use Maps, but as soon as you go offline, we basically lock down or, or disable that map because Google Maps at the API level, at the JavaScript API level, does not support offline. So to, to get, and I'm, personally, I've, I've been looking for somebody like Esri or Mapbox to make a JS offlineable API. Nobody's done so. Everyone really wants you to use their native SDKs, and that's why we, we're kind of building out both examples of Esri and, and Mapbox to be able to plug into the, the current mobile client and take advantage of, of a disconnected map experience. Um, so that, that covers kind of mobile case management, or what does Pega, just as a platform, allow you to do with mobile? I briefly mentioned that we do have a strategic application called uh, Pega Field Service, and right now it's kind of focused on, on the manufacturing space. Um, and it's a full end-to-end -end kind of turnkey solution. It includes some uh, dispatch capabilities, so from a call center you can dispatch a case to a particular uh, individual out in the field, depending on where they are. Um, and it, it basically walks them through, so on the, on the right-hand side, they, they have their work list, you know, they might accept the job or reject the job. Um, they've got a full catalog of parts, so most of this is kind of going out, fixing a refrigerator, installing a particular modem, uh, you know, fixing a printer. I think we're, we're, we've been looking to do some, some things with distributors like beer and, and, and beverage distributors delivering, you know, you know the, the latest set of inventory. So they record what, what was delivered, what, was, what parts were used, um, capture the the, the individual signature, so con confirming that they, they received the things I said that they received, collect time and expense, and eventually do even like a Quilk, Pega NPS, uh, or survey, kind of how did we do, rate us on a scale from one to 10. Um, so this is, this is actually being built out and kind of we're slowly starting to expand beyond manufacturing to healthcare and others. Um, but I, I can see that you know, Pega Field Service eventually will become kind of a way where you can jumpstart kind of some of your field service activities a little bit quicker. Um, but we really need to know what are the use case of what happens in the field, because right now this actually does collect when you accepted a job, how long it took you to travel, the mileage you drove, the expenses, or the hours you spent in the app, et cetera. So it's kind of focused in one area, but I can definitely see it expanding to be a little bit more diverse and encompass some of the other capabilities. Does that include payment processing or any sort of in-field? So that, that would be something where you know, some sort of a module approach would be, a plug-in module would be required, so something like Square. Um, right now, I don't think we've looked at that. I'm looking at Walter. I don't think we've ever done. We haven't brought the financial side. Yeah. So right now, we'd be collecting some information and, and still going back to the server to process it using the traditional server-based so payment processing. So we have with other applications. We have like our warranty application. So where someone would call in, something broke in the machine, it's under warranty. Warranty application we call the field service application to get someone to go out there to fix it with the appropriate part, come back, and then the warranty gets submitted from there. So all that stuff is open to you know, getting the use cases and the scenarios we have out there. So and Walter, Walter Heger is, is actually, I think, director of our strategic applications. Uh, so he's got full visibility and kind of is more than more than happy to hear the use cases of, of how you know, field service or other pieces of PEGA technology can be better, better suited to, to meet your needs. General question about security authentication of the field worker. How do you yep. control access to the device and make sure? So there's multiple ways, right? So there's multiple layers of security, one being at the device itself. You know, you can set up a pin, fingerprint reader. Uh, you can have uh, mobile device management wrappers. So AirWatch and others provide another interface where they're responsible for providing a sandbox kind of a, a secure container on the, on the device itself, which is locked down to the corporate identity provider. And then finally, the app itself, right? So you can authenticate to the phone, that gets you access to the phone. Then you can authenticate to the you know, little, little container within the phone, the secure container. So Samsung has a Knox, which is a FIPS 140-2 compliant secure space. iPhone has just natively, it has 140, FIPS 140-2 secure OSs, um, but from the app perspective, we can we can plug into the existing identity providers that you would have, and we're actually looking to expand that out to include things like OpenID Connect, which is kind of an industry leading, or where the industry is going in terms of taking OAuth 
uh, principles building upon them and using kind of a token-based authentication. So you log in with the app, we talk to a you know, OAuth, OAuth server and authenticate you through that, uh, allowing you to kind of use the, your Active Directory and LDAP behind the scenes to authenticate the user. Finally, I know we're kind of one minute on time. I wanted to kind of highlight some of the additional capabilities. Some of them you saw, some of them are probably brand new. Um, mobile client for Windows. So we've had a lot of questions about it in the past. I know three Pega worlds ago, somebody asked, well, what about Windows devices? Um, so with the, with the latest release, which is coming out a couple weeks, 7722, seven, uh, our mobile, mobile team is actually creating a Windows 10 mobile client. Uh, which is you know executable that works very much the same way as you saw the the mobile client do on iOS and Android, allowing you to take your your work uh, offline on a laptop. So even at the census use case, there's some some consideration that they're going to be providing Chromebooks or just a laptops with technology and hardware being kind of cheap these days. You know why why constrain themselves just to a phone or a tablet? Maybe a laptop makes more sense. So we're, we're proactively tackling that uh, for some of our clients um, that we have and are requesting mobile uh, on Windows as well. You saw multi-language localization support. We're doing a lot of work in terms of improving our kind of developer experience to debug things like push notifications um, and, and adding additional fe features for things like motion sensors. So now you can lock down an app if somebody's driving or if you see somebody you know, running down the street you, know, you can proactively pop up an alert. You know, so adding more and more device-specific capabilities that you can take advantage of as part of your case uh, to say, you know, we're not going to allow you to submit this process if you're going over 30 miles an hour, kind of uh, a proactive safety thing. And then you know, a lot of native capabilities. So uh, originally, um, Pega, you know, we, we used some of the transitions. You know, you know, when you swipe from left to right, a lot of people are, are used to, you, to, to seeing kind of the device native transition uh, where you can swipe or, or pan and zoom. So we actually now have kind of a, 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 a more native looking mobile client, right? So instead of you feeling like you're within a browser, within an app, it actually functions and performs like it would a native app. So from the design time experience, when you pop a menu, you can say you want it to slide out from the left and would look and transition very much like a native application would slide a menu from the left or the right. The same goes for other transitions, you know, fade in, fade out, you know, flip a page, et cetera. So we're building and kind of bridging the gap between the traditional web page, HTML5 capabilities of Pega, and what the native side provides you and kind of blending them together so your end users might not even know they're using kind of a, a mobile hybrid approach uh, because it functions and performs very much like a native application. So with that, we're, I believe, out of time, but uh, we've got 12 minutes for questions or other clarifications that you would like to hear about. Come on, this is the last session. I know it's, I know everyone wants to go home. I'm curious about the, the, how complex the customization is required to build something like that. So since that was very specific to the so it, it's, it's basically building with offline principles in mind. So a lot of traditional PEGA development, you, you're very used to relying on the server for certain things. So it takes a paradigm shift in thinking about things differently to say, well, remember that integration I need in the middle of the process? There's no way I'm going to be able to, to call that in a disconnected mode. So there's some best practices we have you know, at PEGA that we can share in terms of what does it make, what, what is it to do, what do you have to do to think about offline first? Right, there's certain design patterns that might not be able to be done if you're expecting them to work offline natively. But other than that, it, it's traditional, you know, taking the, the PEGA out of the box capabilities that have been approved for offline consumption. So obviously if you, if you want to do REST integrations or other pieces that still require client-server interactions, those are documented as not supported for offline. But there's a huge list of capabilities that, that is supported and it's constantly growing with, it, with each iteration. So as long as you stay within the, the offline guardrails, um, you basically can develop this application using the same technology and same tool set you would do for, for a browser application. So this app, the, 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 at least the, those two apps you saw from the census took me I think we had 10 days 
I mean, you know, a 10 day sprint from business requirements to, to, to a demo. So for me, it, like the listing and mapping, so the, the map one took me four days. That does not include the development of the mapping module, which, which took our team, I think, 21 days to, to build the, the little you know, plugin that we can add to our, to our uh, mobile client to then call out using JavaScript to say, show me a map when I click on a button and pass it the data to render various markers. Does that answer your question? Um, with, with your offline capability deployments, if you've seen, what's about the minimal storage capabilities that the customers are using? That's a, that's a good question. So if, if you didn't hear it, what's the minimal storage requirements? Um, right now, I believe most of these apps are maybe 100 megs in size. Um, in general, it's how, whatever the device has will take. Uh, from a census perspective, there were 16 or 32 was the big question because most of them are, that's the, the general, general direction. I think they're leaning to 32 because iPhone 7 has removed 16, I believe. Uh, so now 32 gigs has become kind of the standard uh, approach. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, from our perspective, unless you store massive amounts of imagery, uh, and for those who are interested, like the vector tiles for the full US, this is not imagery, just the, the base map of road networks is about eight gigs. Um, so if you wanted to preload a device with all the roads uh, and all the waterways you know, at a, as, a, as a base map, that, that, that in itself takes eight gigs worth of data. Uh, but the app itself is you know, 100 megs or so. So depending upon the use case and how much data you need to load on the device, like parts catalog, which our mobile field service uh, application allows you to do, um, that could take up space. But I think within six, even the 16 gig uh, application is more than enough space unless you're getting into the high GIS side of things. Here's the survey capability. You mentioned that Penka kind of has a natural survey yep. feature. So for census, I assume they can do all types of surveys with this technology. What, what's, explain that a little bit. So Penka survey allows you to, instead of building UI screen specific, you know, dragging a field on the, on the screen, uh, we now allow you to have uh, a, basically a form to say this is a survey question. You fill out what does is, what is the instruction text look like, map that to maybe a paragraph or put plain text, fill out how do the answer uh, look like. You know, is it a radio box, is it a drop down, is it a multi-select, um, is it a line left to right, top to bottom, is it required or not required? All of that is then, you know, that, that survey question can be dragged onto the canvas. So as part of the flow processing, you can start sequencing questions and do branching and pathing in various manners, add business, uh, business decisions or decision shapes to say, well, the answer is yes for this question, so I'm going to go down another path. So it's combining both our flow design capabilities and also the smart shapes. So there's a new smart shape in Pega Survey that allows you to literally, as part of your flow processing, ask a question in this, in this step. Uh, so within, within census, they're, gonna, they're basically building out their surveys using the, our flow modeler and taking them both online and offline. Um, right now it's focusing on decennial, but they have, obviously, if, if you know or run a business, there's an economic survey, and then there's a lot of demographic surveys, so a lot of the stat statistics collected, and you see like Department of Labor statistics uh, you know, showing numbers. Those, most of those are collected actually by U.S. Census as a service to those other agencies and provided to them um, as part of kind of the data collection aspect of, of census. So they're looking to actually extend what we're building for, for the decennial to use across all their surveys as part of their SETCAP census enterprise data collection and processing initiative, um, which is very similar to the, the AIG story where they had you know, 80 plus desperate lines of business can, you know, merge into one claim. Census has the same issue. They have 120 different surveys. All of them were doing their own thing. So the set cap or the centralized enterprise data processing is, is, is painting the same vision of let's, let's unify all of those capabilities into under one umbrella and figure out what's different about, you know, demographic survey versus an economic survey. So does that answer your question? Yes. Question in the back. Yeah, could you tell a little bit about the, the transition plan? If you have, if you had a tag application that was built, it wasn't built kind of mobile first. Mm -hmm. or, are, are you finding customers um, taking the, the latter approach where you're building a piece of the functionality and kind of a, a native only? Or are you trying to, are your customers going back to the main core application and kind of 
and the engineering and affordable technology. Is there, a, is there a blended option where some of the capabilities of, a, of an application are being ported out native and the other parts are loaded in? It really depends. So it depends on what, what already exists. All right, so we've got our financial services, which do more of a blended kind of a mashup approach where they take pieces of it, you know, certain case types are embedded in, a, in their native app. Others, like U, UHD actually did the same thing. They started with what you're describing. They started not thinking about offline. Uh, and then we actually, I flew down or up to Minnesota to look at their, at their processes and give kind of an evaluation of where, where they're going to have to do some tweaking. You know, they, they were doing a lot of client-side validation uh, or server-side validation, sorry, uh, that we basically catalog, you know, these are the places where you probably need to adjust your application to meet, you know, if you're going to go offline, you're going to have to do these, these, these updates. If you're not thinking about offline at all, then you shouldn't have to do any rewrites. Right? The, the, the main kind of change or paradigm shift in thinking needs to happen only if you're thinking about going fully disconnected, uh, in which case you can't count on the server at all. Right, so whatever you had to do with the server activities, integrations, server-side validation, those now need to be done on the client side. So um, you, we can definitely look at the, what you have, kind of inventory, what, what, what's going to break or what's going to work you know, in a disconnected mode, and provide you options for how to, how to address it forward. You know, do you branch it and create a mobile-specific version that's directed specifically for, for offline? Or do you, you kind of fix it everywhere and, and, and you know, do it at, the, at a, at a core, core area as opposed to a specific mobile-only approach. But you have options, is the bottom line. Other questions? Do you maintain the vocabulary for the translation, or you take the service from somewhere? No, so this is a good question. So the question was, how do we translate? So it's not on-the-fly translation, so it's part of the PEGA localization that we have. So this is actual content loaded into PEGA to say, when you see this paragraph or this set, you know, yes becomes C, or yes or da, or, or no, and yet, right? This is preloaded into PEGA and then pushed down to the device. Do you have a full control that the, on the client side someone could change the bad translation? Yeah, so this is done back on the server side. You would basically change the translation at the application level to say, you know, this, this translated field is not translated correctly for Spanish and upload a new version. But we've got a full wizard for localization that basically extracts all translatable fields out of the, out of the application that you can then pass to you know, your localization experts uh, that they can fill in the appropriate translations and you can ingest it back into PEGA and have that available as kind of the translated baseline. So who, who does maintain the vocabulary? Is, is it Pega <coughs> delivering those? So Pega delivers the vocabulary, but it's loaded by, by the designers and developers. Okay. So some third party can translate all your, your text for you. You can load it into Pega, and then Pega is responsible for bringing it down onto the device. Oh, OK. So the content is created. It might be created by somebody on the project team, but you might have specific localization experts. So they, it's not like a delivering taking some service from Google. No, no, no. So this, this, this is not you know, on-the-fly translation. Oh. At least we could, but that would break offline. And also in census, they're required specifically to, to use the approved local, localization and translation. So you know, as good as Google is at translating, sometimes the, the context is not that great. You know, so they, they have specific, you know, this is the approved by OMB, approved translation for this particular piece of text. So we, we actually bring it down in that approved manner. All right, thank you.